I'm still somewhat impaired. I am still recovering from a pretty severe fall of a horse. I am literally black and blue in places that you don't want to know about. My body went through quite the trauma a couple of days ago and is still quote unquote suffering the consequences of this trauma. Bruised and buttered in pain. Limited mobility, even though it is getting a lot better already. This range of motion I couldn't dream of a couple of days ago, but it is definitely on the mend. So I really want to honor the enormous healing capacity and resilience of the body. It is remarkable. Yes, I experienced pretty substantial physical harm. I did. And yet, it didn't break my spirit. I didn't go into a state that one would call suffering. Was my body hurting? Yes, absolutely. I had to acknowledge it. But I was still able to acknowledge it with a sense of humor, with gratitude that it could have been much, much, much worse. And despite my physical discomfort, I am mostly in awe of my body's resilience. That is what I am mostly experiencing. I also experience this as a conscious and deliberate choice because I choose to focus on that which gives me strength, joy, happiness, peace. It is a deliberate choice to look upon absolutely everything that happens to you from a place of appreciation. Because I could sit here complaining and lamenting about my misfortune, complaining about the discomfort I'm feeling, the pain I'm feeling, complaining that my newfound equine love is now going to be sold from underneath my buttocks. Instead, I know to focus on all the beauty and reassurance that the same situation also holds within itself. Nothing is good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. It is a slight change in perception that allows for an experience to be empowering, educational, giving rise to appreciation and gratitude, I appreciate the healing capacity of my body. Heck, I appreciate the bounciness of my body because the impact was severe. I'm not going to show you my bruising because that would be entirely inappropriate on YouTube. <laughs> but I can tell you that my whole pelvis is black and blue, literally. I am bruised all over, especially in this area where I slammed into the saddle. It was impactful, I can tell you. And yet here I am experiencing something quite remarkable, which is the unbelievable healing capacity of this body. The unbelievable resilience and bounce back that I have.
That is what I celebrate. Instead of lamenting the accident that happened. And I know to the core of my being that I was exceptionally lucky. I could have easily died. If I had fallen just the wrong way or hit a tree stump or something, I could have broken my back or my neck. I could have been paralyzed or dead as a doornail. And no amount of money, power and influence could have prevented this. Ivana Trump just died a couple of days ago. She fell down the stairs in her condo, in her gilded condo, no doubt. Did any of her wealth prevent this? Did any of her powerful acquaintances were able to prevent this? No, of course not. In the end of the day, we are all subject to decay and death, no matter how much money, power and or influence you are able to rig up in this lifetime. In the end of the day, we're all gonna die. You're welcome. And we know this, and yet we cling like nothing else to these bodies. And we make our entire life about the comfort and freedom of these bodies. When we think about freedom, we think about freedom of movement, freedom of moving this body around. And when we feel limited because we don't have the money to travel or because a disability prevents us from moving our body around in the way we want and would like to, we feel limited. We feel disempowered. We feel not free. A spiritual approach to life speaks of a very different kind of freedom. It speaks of spiritual freedom, spiritual liberation or atonement, a freedom that has nothing to do with the body, a freedom that can be experienced even as your body is limited in time and space, limited by circumstances, limited by health, limited by mobility. It is a freedom to choose your state of mind regardless of how life shows up and what circumstances show up in your life. And it's easy enough for me to sit here and talk about this from a more or less theoretical perspective. It all makes perfect sense. But it is another thing to demonstrate this. And unfortunately, you can only demonstrate these things adequately when you are confronted with circumstances in your physical reality that could easily give rise to negative emotion, give rise to despair, anger, uh, whatever, fear, worry, anxiety, negative states of mind, and choosing to look upon it from a place of peacefulness, love, joy, and connection to source. I can tell you there's always another way of looking at things and you go, well, that's easy enough for you to say because you are blah, 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 blah whatever, and I am experiencing all these limitations 
and I don't feel good about it. Well, I experienced and have experienced plenty of limitations, plenty of circumstances that were less than ideal. And I documented these experiences on a daily basis for years and years and years and years and years, decades even. And I documented this because I realized that book knowledge can only take you so far. And that teaching really is demonstrating. And that is my intention with this YouTube channel. To demonstrate that no matter what happens to you, you can always choose love, choose peace, choose compassion, choose trust and hopefulness choose to look at whatever happens through the eyes of source through the eyes of a expanded vision in which this little lifetime is just one little step one little tiny tiny little step In the greater scheme of things, our lifetime, even if we live to be a hundred, is next to nothing. Compared to eternity, it is a zip and it is gone. And what is gone? Well, our physical expression is gone. When we die, we no longer, ouch, okay, ooh, gosh, okay. I occasionally have to reposition myself just to stay somewhat comfortable, oi, I have the experience of my body hurting, even though I also realize that my body in and of itself can actually not be hurting. And we all know this because once a person is deceased, is dead, we know that we can do whatever we want to this body and this person that used to animate this body is no longer there to experience the pain otherwise associated with for instance being cut up like in an autopsy or being burned as in a cremation Nobody would raise ethical and moral issues around performing an autopsy on somebody when they're dead. Before they're dead, an autopsy is not a good idea. After they die, it's totally fine to cut open a body, right? Or burn a body. So we know that these bodies in and of itself cannot experience pain unless they are associated with an experiencer, somebody animating this body that is experiencing the world through this body, experiencing both loving, tender touch as well as physical pain. It always requires an experiencer to have the experience. Once the experiencer is taken out of the body by death or by sedation, once the experiencer is out of the equation, the body no longer 
is a source of pain. Nor is it a source of pleasure because you can stroke a dead body all you want. Ew. It's not going to experience any pleasure. Oh my butt. Ew. Ouch. Okay. Oof. So this idea, we are not the body, is not as weird or unfamiliar as it may first appear. We all know intuitively that we are not the body. Let's take another mental exercise. I'm not going to demonstrate. If I cut off my arm, would I still be anime? What if I cut both arms off? What if I cut all my limbs off? Would I still be anime? At what point does my identity no longer exist? What body parts are essential to being able to say, oh yeah, this is me. Once my arm is cut off in an accident or what have you, and had, has whatever died, it will be cremated or fuck what, my arm is not who I am, right? Because you can take it and I will still be who I am. If you would take my head, well, then maybe I do cease to exist in this physical form. But there are plenty of body parts that you can take and or alter, including gender, and you will still be you, and I will still be me. Because we are not the body. <laughs> it's that simple. We are not the body. We are that part that is animating the body that is giving life to the body so what are we we are life we are life we are that mysterious force that we call life and when life no longer is associated with this body when this body perishes whether i fall off my horse or fall off the stairs or have a horrible disease and perish we all understand that the moment i die this body now becomes redundant can be buried or burned it is to be disposed of why because it no longer houses the spirit the consciousness the awareness the animator of the body once that is gone the body becomes just a useless lump of flesh and bones. Let me continue with my little exploration on the manual for teachers. And I was going over the characteristics of God's teachers. I talked about trust and the development of trust, honesty, tolerance, gentleness, joy, defenselessness and 
Let me read to you today's subject, generosity. One of the characteristics of God's teachers. The term generosity has special meaning to the teacher of God. It is not the usual meaning of the word. In fact, it is a meaning that must be learned and learned very carefully. Like all the other attributes of God's teachers, this one rests ultimately on trust. For without trust, no one can be generous. In the true sense, to the world, generosity means giving away, in the sense of giving up. To the teachers of God, it means giving away in order to keep. As you give, so shall you receive, and in the giving is the having. This has been emphasized throughout the text and the workbook, but it is perhaps more alien to the thinking of the world than many other ideas in our curriculum. Its greater strangeness lies merely in the obviousness of its reversal of the world's thinking. In the clearest way possible and at the simplest of levels, the word means the exact opposite to the teachers of God and to the world. Within a finite reality, whatever I give away, physical things that I give away, I now no longer have. In the spiritual realm, whatever I give, I simultaneously receive and or have. If I give love, I am experiencing love. In the loving of my brother, I put myself in a loving state and I am experiencing that love. Whether my brother receives my love or not, whether my brother brushes off my love as something of no consequence, me giving love is how I have it. The same goes for peace. If I am in a peaceful state of mind and I give peace to the world, I am experiencing peace. When I am joyful and share my joy, I experience this joy. Whatever has value in the spiritual world only increases by giving it away. Whatever you have in the physical realm is limited. If I have a dollar and I give you a dollar, then I no longer have that dollar, right? Giving you anything in this physical reality deprives me of that thing. I am giving it up. Whereas in the spiritual realm, whatever I share only ever increases. The teacher of God is generous out of self-interest. Of course I want to love you. Of course I want to love you. Because when I am loving you, I am experiencing love. I don't want to fear you. Because when I am fearing you, I am in a state of fear which is unpleasant. When I, God forbid, hate you, I am the one drinking the poison of hate. As I give on a spiritual level, so shall I receive. As a matter of fact, the giving and receiving are instantaneous. If I give love in that moment, I am experiencing love. I am having love in my heart because I am giving it to you.
if I hate you, I give myself a hateful experience. I am hate-filled. I am bearing the burden of hate. I am giving hate to myself. It's not rocket science, guys. It's not rocket science. So the teacher of God is generous out of self-interest. What is my self-interest? Well, I want to feel connected to the source of love and peace and joy and happiness and fulfillment. That's what I want. I want to experience joy and love and peace and happiness and abundance. I want to feel good. And I only can feel good by sharing my goodness with others and coming from a place of what I want to experience. It's a choice. The Course in Miracles teaches it's a choice between love or fear. Those are the two basic states of being or emotions and fear can take many forms just like love can take many forms fear can take the form of attack and war and revenge and hatred and despair and anxiety and worry and ultimately sickness fear can take all those different forms just like love can take the form of tenderness, of care, of joy, of appreciation. But when it comes down to it, it's either one or the other. And what the Course also teaches is that a state of love or joy and happiness and peace and fulfillment, that, that state, that good feeling state, is possible and the natural outcome of self-identifying as spirit rather than as the body because as soon as you self-identify with the body you are now obviously subject to decay and death your body is vulnerable to getting hurt, as I experienced just a couple of days ago. If I self-identify with the body and all things physical, then I am subject to loss, then I am vulnerable, then I have to defend myself and the little that I have against others, which immediately puts those others in the category of potential threats. And I will treat those others as threats rather than as friends. And once I see others as potential threats, I will guard myself against them, putting barriers in between, maybe attacking them before they attack me, etc., etc., and war and conflict and nastiness abounds. The moment I choose to look upon my brothers and sisters as fellow human beings, fellow spiritual beings having this physical experience, then I am entering a very different relationship. Then I am entering the relationship from a place of generosity, where I realize that as I give, so shall I receive. The teacher of God is generous out of self-interest. This does not refer, however, to the self of which the world speaks. The self identified as a body with physical needs and therefore whatever has value has only ever physical value money, clothes, cars, 
luxurious condos and homes, anything and everything that can make the body comfortable and looking great. The teacher of God does not want anything he cannot give away because he realizes it would be valueless to him by definition. What would he want it for? He could only lose because of it. He could not gain. Therefore, he does not seek what only he could keep because that is a guarantee of loss. What you can't share with others is by definition physical and will imprison you in your identification with the body, which as we know, can be over in a split second. Therefore, he does not seek what only he could keep because that is a guarantee of loss. He does not want to suffer. Why should he ensure himself pain? But he does want to keep for himself all the things that are of God. Love and peace and joy and happiness. And therefore, for his son. For his sonship. For his son he created Betzalem Elohim in his image and likeness. There. These are the things that belong to him. These he can give away in true generosity, protecting them forever for himself. I can be truly generous in my love and appreciation and joy. The more I give love, the more I have it. The more I put myself in a appreciative state of mind, the more I perceive to be appreciated. The more joy I share, the more joy I experience all the things that are truly valuable are spiritual in nature and only ever increase by sharing it and that is the essence of true generosity <laughs> ow gosh i am not the body ow ow ow